by recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital of Israel, of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as Genesis 12 says, God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And um, it's a miracle that it took place. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today, once again, wonderfully by the grace of God, connected via Skype with my brother Tom Fress in the United States of America, we came here together tonight to do the 66th reading and discussion of the End Time Delusions, where we are now in the final section of that book, that is Exploding the Israel Deception. We, as I said already, that is Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and me, and I warmly welcome Tom to the broadcast, because I don't do a long introduction, because we really have a lot of work to do. Hello, Tom. Welcome. Yes, and likewise, I'll keep it short and just uh, acknowledge your uh, invitation and my, my blessings to be here and uh, my regards to the listeners, and uh, I hope we all learn something today. Absolutely. Yeah. I hope so too, that we learn a lot even today. So we are starting a new chapter today. Uh, the chapter is called um, The 70th Week of Daniel Delusion. Uh, sev quote 70th Week of Daniel, unquote, Delusion. Yeah. Um, we spoke I wish about I could change the title of that. I would call it the future 70th week of Daniel delusion. <laughs> You're correct. Yeah, that's, exactly. why I was, that's why I was looking for my words, Tom, because I'm not quite uh, confident with this title. Uh, with this title. I, I, no, I think it should, it, should, it should be changed. <laughs> this, is, this is maybe because he put it in uh, quotation marks. You know? Yeah, okay. Yeah? Yeah, because the 70th enough. week of Daniel is not separate from the 69 weeks uh, there before. There is not one well, even... How many, how many, how how many Christians in the world today would even think that the 70th week of Daniel happened to be Jesus' ministry 2,000 years ago? I Nobody think... reckons the 70th week to be a historical event. It's a future event, something that's happened in the future that hasn't happened yet. And, and, and so uh, nobody understands me when I say a future 70th week of Daniel. Well, 
to that to every Christian today, of course the 70th week of Daniel's yet future. It has never happened in the past. That's ridiculous. See, that's just how deluded the Christian world is from top to bottom, from coast to coast. You can't find a Christian today, hardly, that understands that the 70th week of Daniel was 2,000 years ago. And that has led to a world of delusion. And that alone makes the, me the message mandatory to get out of the churches. Get out of the churches. You're never going to know the truth as long as you keep going to liars. Okay, boy, you got my blood boiling already, Yerk. It's just an absurdity. It is the greatest delusion, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It has deceived the entire Christian world. It is like you said in the last broadcast, Tom. If you don't read this, understand this, or discuss this with the passion and the aggressivity, aggressivity, let's call it, in the voice that you very often uh, put to the table, um, then that is just a sign that you didn't understand the gravity That's right. of, uh, of this message. And I right. totally agree with that. So it's good when I got your blood boiling, Tom. It doesn't take much to do that. <laughs> 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 you have a, you have a little boiling a, a, a very low boiling point in that regard you just need to trigger the right words you know and uh, yeah, yeah off you go but that's the same with me you know off we go uh, okay um, let's cut it short off we go we go into chapter five the quote 70th week of Daniel unquote delusion in 1945, after months of agonizing deliberation, here already is the first wrong understanding of the author, according to my understanding, yeah. President Harry Truman finally decided to drop an atomic bomb upon Japan. <laughs> we know it was yeah. not President Harry Truman who decided to drop an atomic bomb on Japan, and it was I not after months of agonizing, and he didn't choose the, no That's Hiroshima right. nor Nagasaki, the places That's of absolutely it. absolutely right. The Jesuit general decided to drop a bomb on Japan, and Harry Truman, a 33rd degree Freemason, had to obey his Jesuit master in Rome. That's the truth. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah. Right or wrong, the author continues, the ultimate goal of his decision was to end World War II and to prevent the death of millions. Now, this is the official story. Don't That's the official believe it. That's right. <laughs> Do not believe this malarkey. The Jesuits, <laughs> yeah, the Jesuits did a payback on Japan for being thrown out of the country centuries ago and made right. the Japanese people enslaved to the papacy by those attacks ever since. That's right. And there was another reason for the Jesuits to want to, do, to attack and to, to destroy Japan, and that is to force the emperor of Japan to relinquish his title. To abduct. His title yeah. was that he was divine and infallible and he was worshipped in Japan like a god and that is a definition and a distinction that belongs to the papacy and the papacy alone the papacy sees itself as the divinely inspired king of kings and lord of lords and the emperor of Japan was forced to become one of his subjects and it took a nuclear detonation to force the, the, the hierarchy of Japan to accept the Pope as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the Emperor of Japan, who had been a deity, was reduced to a vassal of the papacy. He, That's what Harry Truman was in charge of doing. He called himself the Sun God, the Emperor right. of Japan. And there is yep. only one Sun God here on this world, and that is, according to his own words, the papacy. Therefore, right. he couldn't stand having a quote-unquote competitor for the title. It was impossible. Right. He had to be put in place. That's right. And you'll never read any of this in a history book, and you won't hear it from the pulpit of any church. That's because they're protecting these people. Okay? You want the truth? you got to go where the truth is spoken. And that is not in the churches. Back to you. Yeah. 
So on August 6, a bomb called quote unquote Little Boy fell on Hiroshima. Three days later, another bomb called the Fat Man dropped on Nagasaki. Approximately 130,000 people were instantly vaporized. Many have argued whether or not it was the right thing to drop these bombs. But in the minds of those who made that decision, it was for the ultimate good of America. No, it was for the greater glory of God, ad majorum dei gloriam, as That's is right. the motto of the Jesuits. That's, That's what right. it was. That's right. And now you see, dear listener, why it is so important not only to read this book from Steve Wolberg, who we really praise for writing this book, but that you see that even he doesn't mention all important things in the details that Tom and I add to this. And that is not to clap my shoulder or clap Tom's shoulder. The point is no, we have to tell the whole truth. Glorifying ourselves. This is not at all about glorifying ourselves. This is about edifying God's people. That's what this is about. And and if, if something should happen to either me or Yerk, God would simply raise up someone else to do it. Yeah, we're simply always not Jesus. We're obedient servants. We don't look for any glory. We don't look for any praise. We don't look for any money. We don't look for any popularity or celebrity status. We're here because we're committed to this. We're called to it, and we're chosen to it, and we're going to do our jobs. And after that, we'll be rewarded in heaven. Thank you very much. Dear friend, the author continues, it is for the ultimate good of the entire evangelical world for God's bump of truth to now drop upon the gigantic prophetic delusion that is presently believed by millions, I'd say billions. It is time to drop the little boy. We will save the fat man for a later chapter. The Bible says, quote, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Unquote. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, as we cited already numerous times during these readings. Now, have you ever heard of the seven-year period of great tribulation? The whole idea is rooted in two words of the above sentence. And the two words are one week. Supposedly, that period of quote-unquote one week applies to a final seven-year period of great tribulation at the end of time. Right now, all over quote-unquote planet Earth, in books, in magazines, in videos, on the radio, in seminaries, on the internet, and at Bible prophecy conferences, quote-unquote Christians, and I at the quotes here, are talking about events that they firmly believe will occur during a final seven years of tribulation. According to the popular interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, the he refers to a future Antichrist who will eventually make a covenant or peace treaty with the Jews during the final seven years of tribulation. In the midst of this tribulation, this Antichrist will cause quote, the sacrifice to cease, unquote. In order for the sacrifices to cease, they must have been restarted, a point Tom very often made already. Therefore, according to countless modern interpreters, there All must be... Liars. Every one of them liars. Go ahead. There must be a rebuilt third Jewish temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. But I want to draw your attention to two other words here. It says modern interpreters. That's right. Not historical Not interpreters. historicists. Not <laughs> Protestants like Martin Luther and these other people who all saw the papacy as the Antichrist. But modern interpreters who have been misled by Jesuitical seminaries and are being yes, taught the not, truth not and teach the truth. Not only did they see the papacy as the Antichrist, they also acknowledged and wrote and, and spoke 
that the 70th week of Daniel was Christ's ministry in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. That's how they knew who the Antichrist was. See, this is all lost on our generation. Modern interpreters have told the lie, the futurist lie, and it is universally believed in this country and around the world. Like I said at the outset, it's, it's almost impossible to find a Christian that understands that the 70th week of Daniel was literally Christ's ministry. It's, it's impossible to find anybody, almost impossible to find anybody today that understands that that final seven years began at Christ's baptism, three and a half years later to his, his sacrifice on the cross, thus causing the sacrifices and oblations to cease because he was the one and only sacrifice to take away sin, to reconcile us to God, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. And then three and a half years later, Jerusalem had another hearing by, by Stephen. And instead of accepting Jesus, who Stephen testified to, they rejected Jesus and they stoned Stephen and killed him. And from that point on, the prophecy about the Jews and Jerusalem was ended. 490 years had succumbed. And from that point, the gospel went to the Gentiles. The house, <coughs> the house of Cornelius heard the gospel and they received the gospel with gladness. And that's where it remains today among the Gentiles. And, and I credit Yerk every time. When, when asked the question, how do we know that the 70th week of Daniel is over? The answer is clear. The gospel went to the Gentiles where it remains today. That's how you know the 70th week of Daniel is over. Don't let anybody confuse you. Many will say that we understand that there were the first three and a half years when Jesus caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease in the midst of the week, but that's where the end of the prophecy ends. With there's still three and a half years to go. And now they skip to the very end of time. They jump completely over the entire Christian era, and they say God is going to start the prophetic clock all over again with the restoration of the temple, temple mount, temple worship, the sacrifices of animals and goats and sheep and lambs and doves, and then, we're, and then, and then the Antichrist is going to come. It's all a load of hooey. It's all a load of that which falls to the ground from the tail end of a mule. And it's preached all over this world. You can never find a church anywhere on this globe, this earth, that teaches the truth anymore. A truth that was known by all who called themselves Christians. There's never been a period in Christian history where there has been so much universal blindness, so much delusion among God's people. And it's every prophecy seminary, it's every prophecy conference, it's every Bible seminary, it's every place where preachers are cranked out like cookie cutters. They all tell the same Jesuit lie that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. And by teaching this, they make every man, woman, and child on this planet deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny with their mouth that Jesus ever came in the flesh because they say the 70th week of Daniel is future and not history. I don't know how much simpler I can make this for people. This absolutely must be understood. And when, when reality finally sink in, you have to comprehend at that point that the churches are absolutely no refuge for God's people anymore. They are the place where Satan's work is accomplished, where the great delusion is spread to God's people. Where in the world would you expect that Satan would most want to enter to destroy God's people? Why, of course the churches, and that's exactly where he resides now.
and he has ever since 1805 or 1810. And since that time, futurism has become the universal orthodox teaching. You cannot find a church that doesn't teach it, and it is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. It has the greatest consequence to the souls of men and women and children on the planet. And we simply have to repent of futurism and return to pure, biblical, historicist Christianity, Protestant Christianity. We are the laughing stock of the Christian world. And if, if you can read the Bible and determine how apostate the Jews were, how deserving of God's wrath that they were, how deserving of God's punishment that they were. We've learned nothing from the Jews. We make the same mistakes, only worse. And futurism is the creme de la creme of the destruction of Protestantism. It is a Jesuit creation. It is a Roman Catholic deception to destroy Protestantism. And how do we know Protestantism is destroyed? Because no one protests the Antichrist anymore. No one protests the papacy anymore. That was during the days of Protestantism when they protested the man of sin in Rome. They protested his his false way of Christianity. They protested him as the man of sin, the son of perdition. The papacy and every pope in succession from the first to the last is the Antichrist of his day. That is Protestantism. That goes all the way back to the first century Christians. We can't compete or compare with any generation of Christians prior to about 1805. We cannot compare. We are deluded beyond recognition. Any Christian who looked at this generation, our generation, and, and saw with their own eyes and heard with their own ears what we believe and teach in our generation, they would all turn in their graves. And if you think I'm just being melodramatic to draw attention to myself, you are not paying attention. Back to you, Yerk. Well, Tom, if history taught man anything, it is that man did not learn from history. It's absolutely right. Shame to say. But it's a shame. Absolute. I hang my head in shame every day. Listen, the, the listeners automatically have this tendency to think that I'm looking down my long nose at them and, and browbeating them and judging them and condemning them and damning them. But we, I have to. We admit, both have been as deceived as they talk. Absolutely. And that goes for you and that goes for me. I Everything. very often say I lived 45 years of my life in total oblivion. I was a sinner, and I'm still a sinner, but <laughs> I, I loved the sin that I did. Today I hate the sin that I do because of my being reborn. But there is nothing that, that we elevate ourselves to and speak down to anybody. We are, on first of all, on the same level right. with everybody else. Made the same mistakes as everybody else. Make the same mistakes. No excuse. No excuses for that. I live every day in sackcloth and ashes. But we are willing to learn of our mistakes and yep. correct our mistakes in that regard that we now teach the truth. Repent. Sweet repentance. I wish everyone in the sound of my voice could enjoy the sweet repentance that God gives to those who are contrite of heart and acknowledge their sins and confess their sins before the Most High. He loves to reward the saints. You know, after admitting our sin, there's a great restoration. And words cannot describe how it is to be brought back into fellowship with the Most High. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. So in the midst of this tribulation, this Antichrist will cause the sacrifice to cease. In order for the sacrifices to cease, they must have been restarted, and like very often before, we state, 
Therefore, according to countless modern interpreters, there must be a rebuilt Jewish temple, third Jewish temple, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And we said it already in the past, this is the reason World War I and World War II, these crusades started to um, exterminate or try to exterminate the Jews and then give them a home country because without a modern nation state of Israel, there is no modern third Jewish temple in the first place. That's right. All the blood that was shed in order to make this future 70th week of Daniel possible. Only God knows how much sin has transpired, how much bloodshed has been imposed upon the world by the papacy and the kings of the earth over which he ruled to conduct enough persecution to eliminate from this world any Jew who would not return to his ancient Jewish homeland unless God himself, just as he did when he led them out of Egyptian captivity, brought them back to their own land. They were not going to go back. And there was no power on earth that could force them to go back. They knew they were in di diaspora because they disobeyed their father in heaven. And until the glory of Almighty God, the pillar of fire by day and the cloud of uh, by night uh, by day and the and the pillar of fire by night led them back to their homeland, they were not going. <clears throat> and so the United States and all of its allies helped to destroy the Jews, to persecute the Jews, to destroy those who were who were forbidding the Jews to go back to their homeland. That's the role the United States has played in history. Do you think God calls this country a Christian country? Not on your life. The United States has been more instrumental in the, in, in the fulfillment of the future 70th week of Daniel than any other nation on the history of the world, except possibly England. And they are ripe for God's judgment. So you know that when the Gentiles, when the Gentiles persecute the Jews, you know that they are doing Antichrist's work, because right. Christ's work is written here in Romans chapter eleven, verse eleven, where it's Paul says, "I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles." for to provoke them to jealousy. That is what we should write on our flags. Provoke the Jews to jealousy because we have the salvation through Jesus Christ that belongs to them. Now, how can a Christian nation do what its divine commission is, that is to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Jewish Messiah, Jesus, if we are instrumental in their annihilation and their persecution and their uh, their Holocaust. Do you know when you ask a Jew about the Holocaust, the first thing that comes to his mind is them damn Christians. They blame Christianity for the, for the Holocaust, for the persecution of the Jews. Exactly what Satan would have them believe. And who led the persecution of the Jews? Roman Catholics. They've always had a replacement theology that the Jews rejected God and the Roman Catholics were given the title of the chosen people. And that's why they persecute the Jews. They don't try to, they don't try to uh, 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 cause the Jews to be jealous of their Jewish Messiah, Jesus. They hate him because of Roman Catholicism. And to the degree that Protestantism has followed in the footsteps of these persecuting Roman Catholics, the judgment of Almighty God resides upon them. We're to love our Jewish brethren, have sympathy and compassion for them. They gave us the oracles of God. They suffered the punishment of disobedience from their God. We should have learned our lesson from them. Think about it, Tom. 
everybody who hates Jews hates Jesus Christ. That's right. And by do. that cannot be a Christian. And why can I say with confidence that everybody who hates Jews hates Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ came from the tribe of Judah. That's right. He was a quote-unquote Jew. He yeah. was born in Bethlehem. He came out of Nazareth, Judea, yeah. Judah, what today is called Jews. So when you transport bad feelings towards the Jews, you can not call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, right. who is a Jew, in the first That's right. place. Yep, you contradict your Savior, you contradict your salvation when you condemn the Jew. It's the same contradiction you have when you say the 70th week of Daniel is not fulfilled, but Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's right. You it's the same oxymoron. You can't have it both ways. You cannot have the cake and eat it too. Yep. Satan has deceived us and defeated us, reduced us to groveling fools. And I've had enough of it. I've had enough of it. We need to restore true biblical Christianity. And it's historicist eschatology. It's the only way to understand these prophecies. It's the only way to understand history. The only way to make sense out of anything is to return to the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled in history, not the future, history, 2,000 years ago. The 70th week of Daniel was Christ's ministry, Messiah's ministry in the world. Our redemption came in those seven years of Christ's ministry. And if anybody says that any portion of that 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled, or that is to be fulfilled by someone other than Jesus Christ himself 2,000 years ago, he is a liar, and get him out of your fellowship. He will continue to deceive you as long as you're within earshot of him. <clears throat> and that's what makes, that very thing alone is what makes every church in this country unfit for your presence. unfit you know satan is transformed into an angel of light therefore no one should marvel that his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness it's written in the bible satan will take over the churches and he has and it began about 1805 to 1810 in england and it was and it was shipped to this country. And since it was shipped to this country, it has taken over all the churches. The lying wonder called futurism. It has deceived us all, including myself. I'm not one whit better than anyone who's listening to me. I've been on my face in sackcloth and ashes ever since God brought this truth to my knowledge and my understanding. And that's why I'm so committed to keep telling the truth as long as I have a breath and a voice. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. A popular Christian magazine called End Time reflects the cur this current view, quote, Three and one half years after the confirming of the covenant by the Antichrist, the Jews' third temple must be completed and sacrifice and oblation be in progress. We know this because Daniel 9.27 states that in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop, unquote. No, not the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to stop. Here the trouble starts. 
going into explanation of this deliberately spread error will take a while. Well, we did this throughout the last 65 readings, I think. <laughs> I think right. we cannot take any reading out we of this. We can get together. Because Every time we go together, because it's so important to tell the truth again and again and again, because we cannot tell the truth as much as the lie is repeated in the world, because it's only Tom and me. And the lie is repeated by almost everyone in the world. And we cannot speak for millions and billions of people. We can only speak for with our power that God gives us to speak. But we can only repeat it and hope that this repetition of the truth will fall on fruitful ground. And you will understand that it is not the Antichrist who will cause any sacrifice and oblation to stop, but that it was Jesus Christ who definitely ceased any sacrifice and oblation to stop when he went to the cross after three and a half years in his ministry. That's right. Just know this, that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, which is the, the prophecy given about the 70 weeks of Daniel, there is not one mention or one reference directly or indirectly of any antichrist. That prophecy is all about Jesus Christ and no one else. And that magazine calls, himself, calls itself Christian, Tom. That's right. It calls itself Christian falsely. They take the name of the Lord their God in vain. They preach lies to deceive God's people, to damn God's people. To get them, first of all, not to recognize who the historical Antichrist is and not to re re uh, acknowledge who the historical Christ is, but to put before their face a future Antichrist and a future false Christ. That's the whole object of futurism, to put into question who is the Christ. And let me tell you, I'll say it again. If you believe the 70th week of Daniel is future, then you have denied that Jesus has come in the flesh 2,000 years ago because he came at the beginning of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. You have denied with your own mouth that Jesus is the Christ. I don't care what else you say in your life. If you believe the 70th week of Daniel is future, you have already denied that Jesus has come in the flesh. The Bible plainly says that is the spirit of Antichrist, to deny that Messiah has come in the flesh. That's what believing in a future 70th week of Daniel has deluded you to believe. No matter whatever else you say in your Christian life about Jesus, if you say there's a future 70th week of Daniel, you have denied your own salvation. You have denied your own Messiah, Jesus. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot claim Christ to be your Savior and then say the 70th week of Daniel is future. You simply cannot have darkness and light at the same time. Back to you, Yerk. So the author continues to say, much of the Christian world is now locked in a fierce debate about whether Jesus will return for his church before the seven years. This is the pre-tribulation view. In the midst of the seven years, this is the mid-tribulation view. Or at the end of the seven years, which is the post-tribulation view. So, much of the Christian world is now locked into a fierce debate about whether Jesus Christ will return before, in the middle, or after the tribulation. You know, Yet, there's one thing that positively identifies a liar. They never get their story straight time after time after time they tell it. <laughs> it changes every time, doesn't it? That's how you positively identify a liar. They make well, up the exactly lie why the they... Are. They, make they can't up. tell you. They can't tell you if Jesus is going to come pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, or post-tribulation. They change their story every time the subject comes up. Why? Because they're liars. 
Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, they make up this lie while they walk in it, you know? Because they they don't know what to tell you. It, it can take any any time because there may be people who say, but this cannot be because thus and so. Then they just change it. And then all of a sudden it's not pre-tribulation view anymore. Then all of a sudden it's mid-tribulation view. Then somebody else comes and says, but that can't be because of this and this. Then it's not mid-tribulation view again. Then it is post-tribulation view. It is the same... Um, how do you say that? It is uh, it is the same deception that you have with the Jesuits, who on the one hand foment the futurist agenda, and on the same hand foment the um, preterist agenda. Yeah. Antichrist has been fulfilled in the past. A futurism says, well, Antichrist will be fulfilled in the future. Exactly. And those are Earth. those are two Roman Catholic official teachings. That's right. But they can stand next to each other. Yep. There's another point to be made about this, Yerk. Nowhere in Daniel's prophecy is any reference made to tribulation. No. No reference is made. Everybody and when Jesus, and, and when Jesus is, speaks of tribulation, Tom, I think it is in Matthew, when Jesus speaks of tribulation, he never speaks of a seven-year period. No. He that says, in this world, ye will have tribulation. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So how long has the tribulation, the persecution of Christians lasted? Uh, close to 2,000 years. Not seven, 2,000. For a Christian, lifelong. That's right, lifelong persecution. That's right. And anybody who lives a truly godly Christian life is suffering persecution today. And you know, with all these different views, free, mid, post-tribulation, you see that they make up the lie while they walk along with it. Right. They have not a fitting answer to all the questions. So they say it's whether this or it's that or it's that. Yep. Whenever is the Bible in any teaching undecided, like the futurists are on pre, mid, or post-tribulation. I've got another point to make about this. Please. Everybody says that this tribulation is going to take place as soon as the Jews are restored to the land. Seven years. What? The Jewish homeland was established in 1948. 1948. How long's it been? Well... That period of time came and went. There's still no Jewish temple built. There's still no sacrifices being made on Temple Mount some 70 years after the establishment of the Jewish homeland. So they, well, they decided, well, it must not be, the, the, the starting date must not be 1948 when the Jewish homeland was restored. Uh, must have been the Six-Day War in 1967. So we'll count from there. Trouble is, that's way past due, too. So when is this temple ever going to be built? You know what the truth is? God's not going to be in that Jewish temple if it's ever built. God caused that 70 A.D. destruction of the temple. Why? Because the Jews rejected Jesus, so they had no other option but to sew the veil of the temple back together and start instituting animal sacrifices again. And God wouldn't allow it. God wouldn't allow them to eat and drink damnation to themselves. So he had the 10th legion of the Roman army to destroy that temple and level it to the ground. And ever since that day, the Jews have had no Jerusalem and no sacrifice. And well, they should not if they had rejected Jesus. Why should God give them a sacrifice if they rejected the only sacrifice that it could ever take away sin and restore them to full fellowship with God? The Jews have been living without a homeland and without a temple and without a sacrifice ever since for 2,000 years. And God, if, uh, if he allows them to build this cockamamie third temple, he will never dwell in it. I'm here to tell you, Christ no longer dwells in temples made with hands, and he no longer accepts any sacrifice from anybody 
other than the sacrifice of his own son 2,000 years ago. And anybody who makes a sacrifice from that point on eats and drinks damnation to himself, whether that be the Roman Catholics at the, at the Roman Catholic Mass or whether it be a restored Jew to the land of Israel in a rebuilt temple making animal sacrifices. They will do nothing but eat and drink damnation to themselves. There's no other way to prove your rejection of the Lamb of God than to make your own sacrifice. And that's what positively identifies every false cult. If they make sacrifice, they've rejected Christ. You know, you've heard the slogan, if the, if, it, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Well, I'm here to tell you, if they make a sacrifice, it's not a Christian church. It's a synagogue of Satan. If they make a sacrifice, they have positively identified themselves as Christ's enemy. You heard it here first. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tom. So, yet by far the most explosive question, which few seem to be asking, should be, is an end time seven year period of great tribulation really the correct interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 in the first place? And is there a biblical rapture anyway? <laughs> The answer is no. I'm sorry. Historically, Protestant scholars have not applied Daniel 9.27 to a future period of tribulation at all. Neither have they applied the he to the Antichrist. Rather, they applied it to Jesus Christ. Read just the blue underlined or blue marked section. Protestant scholars, and we speak of the Protestant scholars from the beginning of the 16th century, or no, let's say from the 14th century on, because we have to uh, include people like the Morning Star of the Reformation, uh, which was John Wycliffe. Those Protestant scholars applied the he to Jesus Christ. Notice what the world-famous Bible commentary written by Matthew Henry says about Daniel 9.27, quote, By offering himself a sacrifice once and for all, he, speaking of Jesus, shall put an end to all the Levitical sacrifices. He shall cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That's what Daniel said. And Matthew Henry acknowledges that it was Jesus who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. You will never hear that spoken in any church in this country or around the world. Another famous Bible commentary written by Adam Clark says that during the, quote, term of seven years, unquote, Jesus would, quote, confirm or ratify the new covenant with mankind, unquote. Finally, Another well-respected old commentary declares, quote, He shall confirm the covenant, Christ. The confirmation of the covenant is assigned to him. A covenant can only be confirmed if it existed before. That's right. Where did the Antichrist ever make a covenant with anyone according to the Bible? And what gives the Antichrist any authority whatsoever to make a covenant with God's people? And what would be that covenant? What would, would God it be about? honor it? Yeah, what would it be about? It would yeah. be a covenant to destroy them, not to save them. We are going into 10 interesting points now, but this is going to take some time because we don't go into all these points today, I can tell you, because of this little yellow note you see here. The following 10 points, the author says, provide logical and convincing evidence 
that the one week spoken of in Daniel 9.27 does not apply to any future seven-year period of tribulation at all. Rather, this great prophetic period has already been definitely fulfilled in the past. It's called historicism. It was fulfilled in history. Now, if anyone has a question about this, Tom and I made a series some time ago that was called The New Testament Confirms Daniel 70th Week. And you see all the videos listed here. Yeah? This is a broadcast Tom and I did some time ago. We used also at a certain moment some 10 points. We did all together some, was it 28 videos or something? If I'm not mistaken, as I can see them here in the title. Very important. And that already gives you another wonderful view of the subject talked about here in this text. When he says the following 10 points provide logical and convincing evidence. We already spoke in that video series and the link of this uh, playlist I will provide in the description box of this video. And we already did that. But as I said earlier, repetition of the truth is so important because the lie is being repeated many, many times over because we only have two mouths speaking here, not 20 million or 200 million. Anyway, what is behind this yellow little comment here? Here we go into an extra PDF when we go and learn more of what Matthew Henry commented on Daniel chapter 9 and more specifically the verses 24 through 27. Therefore, I have made an own uh, little PDF um, where I copied the comment from Matthew Henry out of ESORT and I put Bible verses most of the time in red and whenever you see something in green that is added by me and for the rest this text is completely Matthew Henry and he goes into the explanation of Daniel chapter 9 verses 20 through 27 and this is why we start with Romans 3 because Romans 3 this is where verse 24 starts and we go only of the verses 24 through 27. But I'd say, even though we are only on 50 minutes, this is a little shorter video than otherwise, I think we now prepared you to go a little bit beyond the book Exploding the Israel Deception. And before we go into the wonderful 10 points that the author Steve Wahlberg provides us here in his book, we go into the Matthew Henry commentary. But that is something I suppose, and I suggest, Tom, if it's okay with you, we do next week and we leave the people a little bit digesting on what we told them today what we taught mm. them today and that in the meantime they have the possibility to either go to my archive account and download the book exploding the israel deception or go to the internet and order that book whether from steve Wolberg's site or anywhere else where they want to order the book and read it for themselves and then come back next week for a discussion of the commentary that Matthew Henry, I think, in the 18th century gave of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Yeah. The listeners are going to see with their own eyes and hear with their own ears what true Bible Protestants believed about Daniel's prophecy. And they're going to be astonished because it's completely contrary to what's taught in the churches today. And everything that we've accused the deceivers of being is going to be revealed positively to you from another source, a very reputable source, Henry Newman, or rather, <laughs> Matthew Henry, excuse me, Matthew Henry, one of the greatest Protestant Bible uh, prophecy expositors, uh, revered uh, for centuries. And uh, you're going to see what true Bible-believing Christians believed prior to the, the onset of futurism in about 1805 and 1810. You're going to see that everything we've said is true. True. 
you're going to know who's the liar and who's telling the truth. You're going to see you're going to see and hear what Christians believed prior to the advent of futurism in God's house. And all your questions will be answered. All your doubts will be dispensed with. And then the war begins to take back the churches, to take back the truth, and to put the liars on the run. Restore the truth in the churches. Make them to be once again a spiritual refuge for God's people. And if we don't have the manpower, the courage, or the prayerful attitude to do it, then we live as vagabonds in the world till Christ comes to destroy it. I'm not comfortable with that. I got too many friends and too many family that believe futurism, lock, stock, and barrel. I can't convince them otherwise. They just won't listen. They just won't listen. They love the lies more than the truth. Therefore, I have no family. How can two walk together unless they agree? You can't. So, I got to make my family. And we're going to agree. That's all there is to it. Join us next week. And we'll give you the proof that will put all doubt to rest. Who is telling the truth? We'll see you next week. We gather today on the eve of a historic anniversary to celebrate what happened here in this very hall 70 years ago when the United Nations declared to the modern world an ancient truth that the Jewish people have a natural, irrevocable right to an independent state in their ancestral and eternal homeland. Mr. Speaker, in these uncertain days, it's important that we cling to the permanent things and the ancient truths. Among them is the principle that fear is useless. What is needed is trust. As we prepare in the next hour to vote on H.R. 2975, the, the Patriot Act of 2001, uh, I rise as a proud member of the House Judiciary Committee to say this legislation is about trust. It is not about fear. It is about trusting the law enforcement authorities of this country with the powers, some temporary, some permanent, to stop those who would wage war on our citizens before they level the attacks. We do not bring this legislation to this floor in fear. We bring this legislation to the floor in trust. We trust in God. We trust in the governing authorities that our God has placed for such a time as this. I urge all of my colleagues to join me in strongly supporting the Patriot Act of 2001, and I yield back the balance of my time. Forsaking God, give us a king. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second Abiah, and they were judges in Beersheba. And the sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. It 
according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, This will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties, and will set them to ear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyard and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your main servants and your godliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which he shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city.